oxides of nitrogen, control burn temperatures, recycle some bad things that, you know, PCB falls in there as well, um, the EVAP, all that stuff is kind of after the fact. But the core of what they're doing is just try out the waste fuel. Right? We just want to make sure every ounce of fuel that goes into the engine gets burned and burned clean and pushes out of the piston and moves us down the track. So you mentioned um, hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, uh, NOx. Um, I know PM is, is becoming a bigger issue, um, always has been with diesel, and is now becoming more of an issue with gasoline. And when I say an issue, it's, it's being measured and, and regulated. Um, where do you find, like, with, when you start working on a calibration, what are the hardest <coughs> of those to really control and keep in balance? Um, PM became more of a problem for us on SI engines, so spark ignited engines, when we went to direct injection. Direct injection is really cool because we get this we get this evaporation at the last possible minute inside the chamber. So it pulls heat out of the charge at the best possible time. So it lets us get away with things that we never could have done on port fuel. It's like having an extra intercooler to the process after the compression stroke has already heated things up, but the fuel is still evaporating. The problem that we run into with that is you're not guaranteed evaporation. So you, if you think about a droplet like a, um, like a, you know, one of those um, suckers with the Tootsie Roll in the middle, right? We might get the outer shell to evaporate, but that little core, we didn't get all the way through that, it didn't evaporate. Well, that little nugget of fuel turns into the particulate matter that you're talking about, right? So, with PFI, we have the advantage of we generally spray at the back of the valve and it gets residence time there. It gets a little time to sit and evaporate. It turns into a complete vapor before it gets sucked into the cylinder and then it gets swirled around. The time between injection and combustion on DI is so short now. That we're, and especially in cases where we're trying to put a lot of fuel in, we're not guaranteed evaporation. So even though we had combustion and we released heat, and we push it on the piston, we're not guaranteed that all of that fuel participated in the same manner. And that's where those little tiny kernels start to form the particulate matter and find their way out. So a lot of times it happens when we're running richer or we're running under higher loads. And we've done a lot in the industry of downsizing, what we call downsizing engines. So where you used to have a four liter engine, now you have a three liter with some sort of charging system. So you know, turbocharged, supercharged, or whatever. And as a power cube, it makes the same horsepower that it used to, but now we run that engine at higher loads. And with DI, now you're in that zone where you might make these particulates. And so it becomes a new challenge to us as a calibrator. So we have to start turning knobs and say, what cases cause that unburned chunk to find its way out the exhaust? Is there anything I can do to move that around? So injection timing becomes a big deal. Is it single pulse? Is it multi-pulse? Is it with some sort of reversion? Do we play with the valve time events to get it to move around? So we've got a lot of creative solutions that we try. And if we can't, then in some cases we just put blocks in the code and say don't go beyond this. And so we put these hard limits in that the guys in the aftermarket look at that and go, why'd they limit that? I can make 50 more foot pounds across the board with my cow. I'm smarter than you yeah. And, they're, and because they're not measuring the PM, they think they're doing a great job. Got it. Uh, Stephen, let's shift gears a little bit. Um, your expertise is in calibrating or building a calibration, <coughs> starting with the base that the ODM has provided, and then modifying that calibration or, or adjusting that calibration, particularly in relation to components that modify components, so superchargers, um, maybe a turbocharger kit, maybe even as simple as an air intake system. Where do you start? What's the kind of the first thing you look at when you start doing uh, a calibration? Well, the first thing we should really think about is how do we model the airflow for a specific engine modification so the ECU be, will be able to understand really the airflow that's being utilized. That will set you up for success in a bunch of different regions. And we're going to have to hit on certain engineering requirements. So power, drivability, emission component durability, and most importantly emissions. 
So to do this, we need to know what inputs we're changing, what components we're changing. If we're changing fuel injectors, obviously those have to be modeled correctly. And that's kind of a discussion in itself. Greg and I were talking about it before. Um, you have to do the correct transfer functions for manifold absolute pressures if we're going from a one bar you know, P ratio of one for an after aspirated application to a force induction application to a three bar. We have to model that or do the transfer function correctly there. And then we're going to really go through the cow and make sure that we haven't adversely affect the, the points that Greg made. Catalyst light off. Um, you have emissions component durability. So one of the things, as you're interacting with those things, uh, onboard diagnostics becomes an issue, right? Yeah, that's, that's another point as well, is, um, is diagnostics. And also, diagnostics is DTCs and red responders. For the diagnostics, there's a lot of things that change with, um, let's go to superchargers or, or turbochargers, because that's when you really exacerbate things a lot. Uh, you have, for example, a positive displacement supercharger. You're changing the volumetric efficiency really right from idle. It's probably the, the, the most evasive uh, aftermarket component you can put on your vehicle in terms of calibration, but also gives, gives us great benefit, right? You get a great torque. Um, you know, increase over a broad RPM range. And that is, you have to change the diagnostics to, you know, have integrity there. You're gonna change the airflow deltas, arrow to map correlations. All these things have to be set up correctly. So bottom line, you need to change those diagnostics so that they have the same OEM deltas allowed as the naturally aspirated calibration, for example. Um, you would take those same percentages, apply them to the new P ratio and natural absolute pressure targets that you're gonna actually see. I see a lot of the time in the aftermarket, those things get blown out to unrealistic values, really counting out the diagnostics. And the integrity there is incorrect and it should be uh, fixed with um, calibrating it to a specific target that you're, you know you're going to get to, and then allowing a certain, you know, delta error that you would link up with the OEM strategy. Stephen, you're familiar with a lot of the aftermarket tools that are available for doing modifications, doing aftermarket calibrations. What are the things that those tools allow you to do, and what are maybe some of the things that you, you wish they could do that, that they don't give you access to? Well, it's funny. The support that they give is the support that they've <laughs> modeled and, and, and they're supporting uh, you know, in their editing package. But there's also, if you look in the binary, you can add user-defined parameters to a lot of these tools. So then you can, it really opens up possibilities. But those are hard to get, especially on newer control systems. We're already limited with what we can flash. That's the biggest hurdle, right? Is if we can't flash or change the, the, the actual calibration side of ECU, we can say we can't support that, that platform in an emission sense because we can't change the computer. Uh, we have to have diagnostics, so we can't go to the standalone, yada, yada. Um, but, yeah, the biggest limitation is, is not having parameters to model the airflow. That's probably the biggest one. That's the most important thing when it comes to uh, controlling or modifying the engine control system or you know engine management system is, is being able to have the, the computer know how much airflow is going into the engine so the load is correct. Um, it, because everything is based on the volumetric efficiency, manifold absolute pressure, or modeled map. And with those things, we can hit certain targets and still utilize factory control 
emission, emissions, cold start, emissions reductions like catalyst light off. A lot of times if you don't model the airflow correctly, you won't even go into catalyst light off because the air load is, is incorrect. Natural absolute pressure inferred map might be incorrect and it won't go into certain predetermined load con, you know, thresholds to go into these specific you know, um, emissions reduction strategies. And then it becomes hard to control the fuel. And then you're there hacking the fuel control to get a certain outcome. Those are the hurdles. Okay. Uh, Kent, I want to talk about something a little bit different here. We, we've been talking about strategies and how, how the uh, current capabilities of a vehicle and, and how we modify them may, may impact emissions. But I think in our industry, it's pretty easy to assume <coughs> that, you know, I, I don't see anything coming out the tailpipe. It really doesn't smell that bad. You know, I, I, can, I can tune around and say, I can make it idle better. You know, so there's, there, there's a lot of um, assumption that emissions really isn't all that big a deal. Um, you're an expert in this area. What can you say about, um, the impact of mobile emissions. So when I say mobile emissions, I'm talking about what's on the road. Um, what is that like? I mean, what is that doing to our atmosphere? What are the things that we really should be concerned about and aware of? Yeah, yeah. great question. And, you know, one thing I was thinking about, I was sitting here, are there any regulators in the room? <laughs> <laughs> you will originally. <laughs> You know, uh, when I was working at university, I, my dad would say, what do you do over there? You know, you study stuff. I said, well, I built some things. He goes, yeah, but have you ever sold anything? You know, so I bet you everywhere in here is, has built something and sold something. No, no, no. Okay. Anyway, I just, you know, it's a big difference. And, you know, I know it must be difficult working in this environment where we have regulations and you're trying to build stuff and sell it and then you're being you know told all these different things EPA does one thing and three does another thing and so but it is important um, anyone like to eat hamburgers <laughs> do you know they make emissions as well but they smell good right so uh, it turns out um, if you eat a hamburger it's equivalent to about 30,000 miles in your diesel truck because of the DPF. That's pretty incredible. That means if you drive and eat, you're exceeding the emission limits. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not advocating not eating hamburgers, I love hamburgers, but we do study all sorts of things. Uh, and it turns out restaurant emissions is probably the number one in emission we have right now. But we still have to live within the, the constraints of what we have. So, like your car, your passenger car, like a, a gasoline, or fuel injected, or direct injected, really clean, really well controlled. We did the concentric retesting for Volkswagen. You know, after they made a big scandal, they had to do three years worth of testing. So we tested 10 cars per year. We couldn't find anything wrong. I mean, the emissions were so low, it was really nice. Now, what happens when you take that car and drive really fast? You know, I got to drive an R8. That was incredible. I mean, I have a, a minivan. I have three minivans. I have six kids, four kids, but six people in the family. But, um, you know, these, when we're driving fast like that, and creating a lot of hydrocarbons or a lot of NOx, they do create uh, photochemical smog in our atmosphere. And congested cities like Los Angeles, where we have what, 20 million people all in one area, two really large ports, Long Beach and LA. You just bring it all together, and then you have the, the land where the, the current will bring the air mass right up against the mountains, the sun cooks it, and you create photochemical smog. You create ozone, you create PM, asthma, and all sorts of things, and they've even attributed to cancers and different things that will shorten people's lives. And where are most of the people moving to? I heard by 2025, 80% of our population is going to live in these mega cities. Where do we spend most of our time driving and back and forth to work on freeways where uh, these emissions are quite high? So, you know, 
maintaining a vehicle's emissions is really important. Now, I'm not going to advocate if I lived in Nevada or in Nebraska, it's probably not as big a deal, but we have one standard kind of fits all for the United States. I, I think there could be leniency there, but I'm an academic and I can look at data and say there's not going to be a problem in Minnesota when it's cold, but there is going to be a problem in LA when it's hot. And I live in LA or Riverside. So, you know, these things do matter. It comes out of the tailpipe, it does mix, the atmosphere does other things, cow manure does another thing to it, and the next thing you know, you have. So just to clarify a little bit, you mentioned health risks. You didn't talk a lot about global warming. I'm kind of curious about that. Um, each of the constituents that we measure out of the tailpipe, um, or from evaporators, and we'll talk about evaporators a little bit later, but um, each of those constituents, what are they contributing to? And you have an opinion as to kind of what the greatest area of concern might be. Yeah, so I don't know. Anyone's really studied photochemical smog in this room? <laughs> you know, um, so hydrocarbons tend to think about it in a ramp like this, and then NOx is kind of a little steep. So I think of this as my Datsun 210, and what's a good fast car? Like a Cobra? Would you use that one? And we could limit hydrocarbons all we want, and we're just not going to make any uh, depression in ozone. But if we drop NOx really nicely, we can really reduce ozone. So in, in a lot of these mega cities, Houston, uh, New York, uh, and in California and Los Angeles, there's a lot of desire to drop the NO as much as we can. And so there's a whole new regulation coming out for diesels in 2027, like starting in 2024. And the life of the vehicle, the passenger car, only contributes about 30, uh, three or eight percent. So it's not a lot in the car. But for the diesel, it's around uh, 30%. I also do testing on ocean-going vessels. So this is like 80,000 horsepower engines that move a uh, 15,000 container vessel from one part of China over to Long Beach. Um, just to give you an example, on one of those, it's like 24 grams per horsepower hour, where a diesel truck right now cruises are like 0.05. I mean, one of those tankers is just so much. And where does it tend to come into and all that congestion happens in those ports? So NO is a real big problem right now. And if you look at our ozone standard, we're mostly in exceedances, I think maybe 90 days out of the year uh, in Los Angeles. So then the rest of them, the, the hydrocarbons, we've really improved our fuels. Um, there's <coughs> still some things to be concerned about with EVAP. It's not something we want to let go, and that's why it's still a 3% number. So when these aftermarket parts do get put on these vehicles, it's good to, to keep it. Did you have something to comment? Well, for scale, yeah. can you guys, can you give these guys a little bit of a comparison? So like if they go through Seaman Garage and they have the certified 11, 3, bin 70, right? can you kind of give them an example of what that means as far as NO specifically, right? For NO levels coming from a vehicle like that versus the background sample at Port of Long Beach versus background sample in the middle of America. Yeah, it's it's actually getting even more interesting because of the jet stream with China um, under so much manufacturing. I mean, almost the entire world of goods are now coming from China. And if you look at the, the factories that are producing those goods, you can see these NO2 signatures. And it just comes straight up converts into, you've got NO and NO2, hits the jet stream and it comes right over to California. Our baseline is going up. Then you have the port just dumping in all these ocean-going vessels, all the container vessels, all the trucks coming in. And because SCR doesn't work that well in congestion, those emissions are actually like engine out emissions. So now all of a sudden your background NO number is coming up where the light duty vehicle does look cleaner in the background. So, so by driving an SI engine in Long Beach, I'm not advocating that, but yes, <laughs> they're breathing the air, right? Because we, as we, we don't think about that, we have to convert that stuff, right? We get a second chance to process it, though, right? We, we process it in the combustion chamber, we process it in the catalyst. But our tailpipe, yeah, it's coming out of the vehicle, we're, we're actually been pretty good about it as an industry, right? So if we're being responsible, 
We're staying lambda one, we're keeping that catalyst active. We're doing a pretty good job, and we actually don't make a huge impact on the environment. The key here is we want to keep it that way. So I want to throw out a question that I think all three of you will be able to comment on. Um, when we're doing emissions testing for aftermarket products, we're typically testing in, we're, we're, we're running tests that are, uh, that fall into one of four individual tests. Usually there's the FTP 75, which includes a cold start. There's the US 06, which is kind of the aggressive, you know, highway speed driving test. There's the SCO3, not quite used as commonly. Um, sometimes we have to run it because there's a composite standard that we're dealing with, which involves results from all three of those tests. Um, and then there's the highway fuel economy test, which is probably the least used of the four. Um, the, the FTP 75 is what we call a cold start test. So it's a, it's a test that uh, starts with the vehicle at room temperature, essentially. So, Greg, you talked a little bit about cat light off and um, the, the fact that, and so when we run an FTP 75, there's, a, there's a, a period of time at the beginning of that test where the catalyst is not doing really anything. Uh, that period of time it can be probably anywhere from 30 seconds to two minutes, is, 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 that's kind of my observation of what I've seen, depending on, on the tune and the, and the product that it's talking about. I'm curious, just to all three of you, how critical is that first start, that, that cold start phase? Um, how much, you know, percentage-wise, you know, if, if you're, so if, if you're tuning, if you're developing a tune, how much attention do you have to pay to those, those first, say, two minutes of operation? Your tailpipe emissions equal your engine out emissions, which that's the important part, because mm -hmm. you don't have an after treatment working. You're not, your mid-bed catalyst temp's not at around 250 C where it starts to, to reduce species, hydrocarbons, CO, NOx. It's extremely important. And you, you have to also make sure that your catalyst over temp control is not too aggressive. You know, we're talking, and it's different for every engine, right? But let's say 10 degrees after top dead center. Well, you're, if you're, you're trying to be more aggressive by trying to take the heat out of the combustion chamber and put it to the catalyst to warm up the catalyst, that's the bottom line of what um, we're doing with that. You could go potentially too aggressive and create um, a misfire issue. You could also go too lean. You probably want to be around, let's just say, 0.85 lambda at your peak, you know, rich point, and then try to get to stoic, just like Greg was saying, as fast as possible. If you're too aggressive with that, you're gonna create unstable combustion, you're gonna have misfire, you're gonna send raw hydrocarbons out of the tailpipe. That's a big part, um, partly because the catalyst is not working. So I would say it's extremely, you know, critical. Now you can say that the, the first phase of the FTP gets weighted differently in the first three phases, this is true. But still, you can have so much, so many, so many, uh, you know, emissions accruing there that it really kind of makes the rest of the test an uh, uphill battle. Yeah, I mean, do the math, right? It's with bin seventy, you're about seventy milligrams per mile across the FTP. And if it's a seven mile test, okay, well then we have a total ceiling of milligrams that we could let go out the tailpipe. A poorly tuned system can blow right through that number in 15 seconds. Yep. And it doesn't matter what you did on the whole, you might as well just stop the test before the end of bag one because you've already used all of your available emissions. So, as such, that front end of the test, I would say, requires probably about 80 <coughs> to 90% of my attention as an emissions calibrator. Okay. The mobile data will show you. If you look at the mobile data when they, they first fire up the engine and you look at total accumulated, so you look at the integral of NOx and NMOG, it's going to go up like this, and then it's going, and you'll see where the catalyst lights off and kind of leans over, and it only accumulates very slowly through the rest of the test if you're doing it right. Now, there's some other opportunities for us to screw that up, but most of our emissions happens in the front end of the test. 
So, you know, I'm trying to play the game. I want to get that cat working right, but it's going to be a very good point about misfire. There's no worse thing I can do for emissions than have a misfire, right? All of those milligrams of fuel go out as NMOG, and that gets very effectively counted when CVS comes. Right? And it all goes right out on the, on the scorecard. So I'd rather burn it poorly than not burn it at all. I'd rather burn it clean, but burning it clean usually means burning it almost entirely inside the chamber. And for the first 10 or 15 seconds, it's kind of a bad bet. Right? I'd rather burn it not so awesome, but good enough, and then dump the energy to the cabinets. You just gotta make sure that you're kind of keeping track of that scorecard. So it's a lot harder to pass emissions with physically larger engines because you've got, you know, if you've got a seven liter engine, you're trying to pass cold start. Well, every two revolutions of the engine pushes seven liters of stuff out the tailpipes. Versus an OEM application where they have a turbocharged 1.5 liter. Well, I can be a little sloppier on a cold start on a 1.5 because the total magnitude of stuff I let go out the tailpipe isn't as bad on the 1.5, but on a you know, six or seven liter engine, if I'm off by a little bit, it's getting magnified by the total displacement of the engine. I better really pay attention on that. Now, the, the 1.5 gets into trouble later when we get into high loads. Right? So that's why we have a US 06 and an SCO3, because they said, well, you know, people drive more aggressively, they use more of the engine. Here in this room, most of us are working on very capable engines. Our power to weight ratio is phenomenal in most of the stuff we start with, and we make it better. So in all reality, driving a US 06 for us should kind of be a chip shot. We shouldn't have to work the engine too hard to make those acceleration rates that are on the test. And so now all you gotta do is not screw up. Right? So yeah. keep it somewhere near lambda one, don't allow a huge deviation. So this is easier said than done. You know, so all your steady state fueling is pretty close. Now we need to make sure our transient fueling doesn't break as we tip and tip out. You know, one thing I see that's interesting um, is a lot of people don't have much info. They have the least amount of info on cold start, partly because they don't have the um, vehicle instrumented with any auxiliary equipment. Now, even if you have wide bands in a factory vehicle, those are going to start to, you know, heat the heating element in that. A uh, lamp sensor is going to start to heat. It won't be able to be utilized for fuel control for, let's say, at least 10 seconds. This is at a 20 to 30 C ambient start, like we do on the FTP 75. Um, this does not take into account colder temperatures. Now, to do that, you need to have an auxiliary lambda sensor that's going to be powered with a auxiliary power supply to capture that time. And it might seem trivial and, oh, that's obvious, but no big deal. I see it done, I don't see it done enough. And that creates this like blind calibration um, phase where you, you, you think you go lean and then you, you try to go rich, but you don't actually know what the fuel control is, what's happening there. And I've been involved in this for, for a lot of experience, Peter could second that. We've been testing at their lab and they, um, since they were since they were at the SEMA garage with many systems and other labs before that. And that is so crucial to know what the peak lambda, or you know, what the peak rich lambda is during engine start and how fast you're going to get to stoic after you started the vehicle. And if you can. Can, can optimize that, you'll, you'll have success. You'll, you'll definitely set yourself up for success. But if you don't know what the actual fuel control is, you're working blind. If, if you can get there blind, awesome. But it'll take you twice or three times as long. And we all know for testing at an emissions lab, at a certified emissions lab, we're spending some some bucks on that. So I think we need to also think about the instrumentation that can help us to hit these uh, you know requirements. Yeah, try, try to get there as quickly as possible with the today. most efficient way, yes. Yeah. yeah, so just to jump on that, one of the things that you're seeing and maybe some people in the room are, aren't aware of is that let's remember how an oxygen sensor works, right? It's a heated ceramic element 
stuck in the exhaust. So A, we have to heat it up. Mm -hmm. But coming from the OEM side, I'll tell you, we don't heat it up right away because we're worried about breaking it. The exhaust, one of the primary components of hydrocarbon combustion, not to prove it again either, is water. And so we're putting a lot of water into the exhaust. And when the exhaust is cool, it's below the dew point. So guess what happens when liquid water hits a heated ceramic element? It breaks the O2 sensor permanently and drives warranty costs up. And then, oh, by the way, now good luck with your emission. Right? So the OEMs have strategies in there. There is a delay, and then there's a warm up time for your oxygen sensors. And they cannot go closed loop until we cross that threshold of the dew point, then we can heat it, then we can start getting a lambda measurement and correcting it. Now, when we're in a part 1066 lab with the CVS column, they're already at the temp, they're already sampling everything coming out the tailpipe, they can see what's going on. To Stephen's point, if you're willing to put a little bit of damage into your external you ego. Yeah, they definitely put an external one in. It's not waiting for the dew point. Now we we're putting it in danger zone. We might hurt it. That's development, right? I'd rather hurt my development tool than release millions of vehicles, right? Because it's depending on what program you work on, right? I worked on a Ford Focus once. They made a couple of them. Right? So we have to make sure that fleet of vehicles is going to be okay. And so we know the vehicle is just operating blind and open loop based on somebody's previous experience as a calibrator on that day that they were calibrating that stuff. Right? So you, you, in order to get that data, we're going to have this feed forward into the model. There's no pin loop to correct it after the fact yet. So we have to get that right first. I'm glad you bring that up because, yes, this, it, it does uh, put the lambda sensor in a danger, danger zone there. But for the reasons that Greg and I spoke on, I can hurt it for that exercise. I think, uh, thank Greg, you kind of hit on a key takeaway fr from this session. And, and, and I think this gets talked about a lot, but you know, calibrators may look at the OEM calibration. Well, I knew better than that. I think you said that early on. Um, they're doing what they're doing for a reason. And ev everything that looks like a compromise, well, it is a compromise because they're, they have the, they have to honor the capability of the sensors. They, they have a, a, a an obligation for those components to be durable for the, the useful life of the vehicle. Yeah, so we don't need full useful life, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's there's always strategies involved that, that you know we may not see or understand, but that's that's really feeding into uh, what ultimately happens. Yeah, um, from the audit standpoint, right? You, can't, you guys have probably seen it. You, they pull, you know, ARB and EPA pull vehicles off the road, right? Yes. Yep. And they kind of don't care what the odometer is, right? Yeah, and might. it's got to pass. In a couple of minutes, we'll transition to Q and A time. But I do, uh, Ken, I want to talk a little bit about evaporative emissions. So we just came off the subject of cold start. Um, so maybe you can compare, and, and let me just kind of set the stage a little bit. When I talk about everything we've talked about so far, has been uh, exhaust emissions. Um, and what I, the way I usually describe it is exhaust emissions is what we, what we measure while the engine is running. Evaporative emissions is what's happening when the vehicle is not running or when the engine is not running. Um, I, I think this is something that's very hard for us to, again, put into perspective. We don't see it. We don't see the hydrocarbons coming off of the vehicle in the middle of the day. Um, can you maybe put a little perspective on evaporative emissions? How critical is it? How um, how does it maybe compare to the cold start issue? You know, is there is one more significant than the other? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. And you know, one of the things we didn't really talk about when we were talking about cold starts is what's happening to the environment. You know, I know we think about the FTP and we think about these cycles, but when those emissions are coming out, I mean, there's maybe 100 people in this room, 50. We're starting all of our cars in that kind of same community. We tend to go to work around the same time, so there's a huge release of all of these emissions. And once they're out, they're, they're gone. And it's about 90% of the FTP is in that first two minutes. So now we've just all started our cars, we all drive to work, and then we leave the car there. And then when we come home, it's another cold start. So if, you, if you're actually working in your vehicle, 
table and you're keeping it warm all day. There's really no emissions for the rest of that, that trip. It's really all when you left your house. Uh, it's even worse when you think about freight because there could be a warehouse with a thousand trucks and they tend to move at the same time and so you get all these emissions. Um, now with evaporative emissions, in the morning when the car is cold, it's really low. But I don't know if you live in Las Vegas, you live in Arizona, you live in California, and when that car is sitting out there and it's baking in that sun, those hydrocarbons are just boiling, they're vaporizing, their canisters are filling, you're just, they're just emitting. Uh, I don't think we really know how high it is because the evaporative test is done, I don't, what's the temperature done? I, don't yeah, I think it goes from, um, I want to say 68 to 95. There's two, there's two different calculations. 65. 72 to 105. 105. 105. So there's two different. You guys know how hot a car gets sitting in the sun? So, you know, EPA, I know we were doing, so I was doing emissions testing with a different piece of equipment, and we said we don't want to go over 100 degrees C temperature, or 100 degrees um, Fahrenheit days. So I was driving, it's like 95. The back of the area where the, the fuel uh, section was like 165. Underneath, from the asphalt, going up was 180. Yeah, and we went on a hot trip. We came out to Las Vegas yeah. on a hot trip, or Phoenix, and it's not 115 degrees. I feel like I wasted the trip <laughs> as a calibrator. Right? I want to see what a hot trip would be as an OEM calibrator putting it under those hot Yeah, conditions. because part of our job there is, number one, driving in that hot ambient condition, and number two, parking it. So yeah, you better believe on a hot trip, as calibrators, we stop and get lunch. We stop and look at data for a while. We change and drive this other car for a few hours, then we come back to this car and drive it again. And so yes, we are seeing it. We're looking for the vapor lock. We're looking to see, oh, geez, can I run canister purge when that canister really is full? And I better be able to purge at idle. So not when I'm driving down a freeway at 50 miles an hour when it's easy, yeah. but wow, there's a lot of stuff that I don't want to escape. So I've, I've captured it in this charcoal canister and I want, it, I want to turn that into tailpipe emissions, not evaporative emissions, essentially, right? Yeah. Because by, before it can become tailpipe emissions, it gets a chance to go through the combustion chamber and go through a catalyst. How long does it take to fill up a canister in, in like 100 degree weather? Um, how cold is the fuel tank? Yeah. Right? It can go pretty darn quick. And again, we don't really have a way other than looking at fuel tank pressure. Right? So that we, that's, if we can look at temperatures and pressure, we're not measuring the mass in a charcoal canister. It's not like you know, the, the canister loaded in the board on EP where it's sitting on a scale in a you know, controlled environment. You say, okay, well, it's got this many, you know, this many grams in it. No, it's just full. And so I know that every time I open, you know, as a calibrator, if I'm doing fuel control and I'm trying to do purge cap, every time that solenoid is open between the canister and the intake manifold, I can see my lambda sensors drip rich. Oh, well, there, there was real fuel that would have otherwise escaped, and now at least I'm using it. And, and just to give you a perspective on, on the emission levels, uh, coming out of the tailpipe, uh, your total hydrocarbon is around 2 or 3 ppm. Your background is around 2 or 3 ppm. So basically it's zero. The canister or the vapor is coming out of the fuel tank, that would be a million, basically. <coughs> 100% because it's it's just it's raw fuel and so that's a huge number and it just depends on the flow rate and, and where it's coming from so it's and then there's nothing burnt in it so it's the entire hydrocarbon chain we've got about 10 minutes left let's uh if you'd like to ask a question just line up at the microphone there um and uh while you're doing <coughs> that um i'll i want to just throw throw one in uh, kent um regarding Heavy duty. You're, you're pretty expert in the area of heavy duty emissions. Um, when we think about, and, and, and obviously you have a lot of knowledge in the light duty segment, we're in this room, we're probably more concerned with light duty than anything, maybe getting into some medium duty stuff. But um, in the overall big picture, um, how do you know, how do, what do we see in the heavy duty segment versus the light duty segment? Yeah, so for NOx, uh, I think I said earlier, 
30% of the inventory that we're trying to reduce is, is a result of the heavy truck, the diesel truck. Uh, and that's assuming that they had worked well. So when SCR came out, we were assuming that they would be running around 0.2 grams NOx, but they're actually running around two. Uh, and that's partly because in Los Angeles, stop and go traffic, the catalyst isn't lit off, and so you have high NOx. So we really don't know where our inventory is. So what ARB has done is we're going to ratchet that down to now it's going to be 0.05 or 0.02, and that's actually coming in line with where the passenger vehicle is. So your your gasoline spark ignited engine, we're, we're starting to look almost on the same gram per mile level. Um, the gasoline is around 8% of the inventory. Ocean going vessels are roughly 10. Stationary starts is maybe 15. So we brought them all down, and the, the diesel truck is still the bigger. Uh, and the medium the mobile truck. source is still the biggest chunk. Yes, the biggest chunk. Yeah. And then once we get this new regulation out for mobile sources, it looks like a construction ag is the next big one. And that one's tough because the ag industry has always been a hard one to, to hit up with, with new after treatment and technologies just because it just seems like a, a difficult industry to break into. It's kind Steve, of the core of America. Stephen or Greg, um, either one of you want to comment on diesel at all and just kind of um, thinking through the aftermarket modifications in diesel and, and how that can impact uh, emissions calibrations? I mean, the first answer is obviously like, avoid the defeat devices, right? You know, the DPF and the SCR, that's in there for a reason, right? So you're going to have to work around it because without those, the emissions, you know, when we were here at SEMA a couple of years ago, right, we had our friend at the EPA said, you know, hey, look, you know, all these deleted trucks went by, it's like 317 trucks all went by here at the same time, right? Don't do that. Rolling smoke, to me as a combustion engineer, rolling smoke just, you know, rolling coal just says I don't know how to calibrate. Because all those little particles are fuel that could have been evaporated, could have burned, and could have pushed on the piston. Right? You know, there's plenty of guys out here in this industry who are making good power with diesel that don't have sooty tailpipes. Right? To me, it's just wasted opportunity. So, you know, it, it, I just look at that and I kind of chuckle because, you know, clearly you're doing something wrong. Yeah, you made a little bit more torque. But you couldn't make more. You wasted the fuel. I mean, why don't we just pour some out on the ground before we put it in the truck? Just cut out the middle. Yeah, you want to leave the air flow in my head. You would you would have the same engineering requirements or thought process to to do a ideal diesel calibration as you would um, a gasoline spark ignition calibration, regardless of being compression ignition. Uh, the specifics are different, but the fundamental um, way to go into deriving at your ideal calibration is the same process. You want to worry about emissions. I think most importantly, you're going to have to keep the requirements for power. You're going to try to get those and be efficient, like what Greg said, <coughs> using excess fuel um, because you're not burning in the combustion chamber. You want to have, we haven't really touched on emissions component here really, it's a big one. There's ways to do this correctly and still make your power goals. It's another part of the calibration that is, is very important, kind of in depth, but there's a different strategy to do it in diesel. You would, you would, you would run a linear mixture where in gasoline spark ignition, you would run a richer mixture. Also, I talked about the airflow modeling. Um, I, I talked about that a lot. That'll that'll help with the inferred mid bed catalyst amp, which will become an important component to the catalyst in after treatment variability or emission component variability. But if you don't do that correctly, you'll blow your USO six. I've seen it many times. We've talked about that. We've been talking a lot about FTP seventy five for cold start reasons, but USO six. Where I see the biggest issue in that inherently is catalyst over temp that's too evasive. You also have it, and that's because the, the mid bed catalyst temperature is, the inferred mid bed, ta mid -bed catalyst temperature is, is the model's off because of what we've done to you know, the engine with that mark components we put in there. But it could also be that it's, it doesn't do anything. 
And yeah, you, won't, you might not have a, an issue on the EOS 6 because it's not becoming rich and creating high CO and uh, hydrocarbons as well or edmog. But when you go out in the field, it actually doesn't protect the catalyst. You have catalyst failure, and then your emissions accrue. And then if you ever get an audit or confirmatory test, you're you're, you're in a tough spot, kind of hosed there. You also have to, after you pass the emissions and hit the emissions targets for specific species, you have to divulge all this information to the regulators, let's say California Air Resource Board, how that your engineering is sound and you've done it correctly. How that gets done, that's a discussion in itself. We can imagine that some people um, are, you know, some, some ways you do the work is, if you didn't do the work, how do you answer that question with high integrity? You don't have data to show that you've, your, your engineering sound. Anything you put down on that paper is, yes, incorrect in my opinion. So, so I think we should focus on that. We're, um, we're coming close to our time, so I'm going to ask one more question. Um, I'm going to try to make this kind of broad, but um, you know, we've talked a lot about calibration today, but there are a lot of products that, that are sold that it don't involve calibration. It could mm -hmm. be, say, a cold air intake system or an exhaust header or yep. you know, things along those lines. Um, what are the... Uh, potential concerns there? What are some strategies that need to be followed in those product designs to uh, to ensure that best opportunity to meet the emissions requirements? And then maybe on top of that, what, is, what are Greg and Stephen, what are some of the big mistakes that you see being made um, in, in, you know, in tuning and in um, trying to, to meet emissions with that one? I'll let maybe Greg go first because I set a couple of them right now. Yeah, I mean, for those other parts, I mean, if you put your part on, intercool is a great example because the incoming charge temp just gets lower. DC reads that lower temp with its 10 cent so it does its normal thing. It doesn't know the difference between a good intercooler and a nice cool air day outside. Awesome. Love it. Headers mm. in the gray area, some cold air kits, as long as they don't screw up the map transfer function too much. We can validate that really easy. We just look at the future. Mm -hmm. yeah, if your fuel trims are railed out at plus 20, then you're probably going to be in an area where, yeah, you probably have an emissions issue. But if your fuel trims start at plus 3, and now they're you know, plus 5, I'm reasonably certain that that product's probably not screwing up the fuel delivery that well. Now, one of the biggest problems I saw over decades, one of the biggest problems I always ran into was you know, with fuel control, trying to find lambda 1, well, how do I get there? was that for the longest time, we just couldn't get good data on how much fuel we're putting in the engine. We didn't know what these fuel injectors really did, because there's more to a fuel injector than just a linear flow rate. We need the offsets, we need the nonlinearity, all this stuff, right? I would just ride the suppliers. Hey, you guys gotta tell me more about your product so that I, the calibrator, can make it work. If you lie to me about offset or nonlinearity, the place that it screws up is not wide open for all the power. That's easy. Watt power is so easy. Training monkeys can make watt power, but passing emissions means that your first guess was really close every single time, and we're using relatively small fuel masses at small pulse rates. And so over time, I did a lot of testing for companies that needed that information, and I just ended up making a very good dozen because I got so mad at not having the data as a calibrator. All right, well, thank you guys very much for your input. This has been a good session. I, I have a favor to ask if you would scan the QR code that's on the chair in front of you and just fill out that survey. That will really help us for future plans.